Hey everyone, welcome back to Sells to Sell. Uh, my name is Heem, that's Nick, and we have a very special guest with us here today. This is Brandon Sasuni. You want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi there. I'm Brandon, I'm from New York, and I just started my master's program here at Case Western, studying regenerative medicine and entrepreneurship. So trying to break through and bring some of my prior stem cell research uh, into the market with some new innovations. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, the the stuff that you've told me in the past and we were just talking about before we started recording is literally so exciting. And we've kind of hinted at some of the stuff on the show, but we've never actually got to go into depth. And I think that bringing you on today is the perfect kind of, you know, segue into these you know, new and innovative ideas like at its core, like the people who are actually having them. Um, so, I mean, I know he's super excited for today and so yeah. am I. So what, so what is like, just like more like a background, like where'd you go to school? What did you study? Yeah. Like so that kind of I, stuff. I uh, went to school undergrad at Duke University studying philosophy. And at the time I had no knowledge that I was interested in biology or cells and I was really just trying to figure out like what's important in life, what's going on in our minds in a sense, um, and trying to understand you know, how that gives us knowledge about who we are. And I think I kind of pushed that a little bit to, to its extreme in terms of uh, you know, philosophy of mind and philosophy of identity. And at a certain point, I felt the need that, okay, I have to get more practical and learn something that translates more into the real world as well. And I think it, through that, questioning of being a philosopher and what it means to be human and what is my identity and trying to gain real answers, I was forced into looking at biology as well. And, you know, trying to understand, okay, if I'm, if I, my, if my mind and my identity are being powered and propelled by my brain, how's my brain functioning? And okay, I'm completely made up of cells and I came from a single cell. And so you know, in, in all these ways, it started to connect back to my identity being extremely linked and fueled by the processes and bases of my biology. Yeah. So then I, then I, at the same time, biology is not just philosophical, but it's also extremely practical in terms of my own benefit for my own life in that uh, you know, I'm a little bit health conscious and I want to maintain a healthy long lifespan. So, you know, instead of just looking at, uh, you know, how am I, how am I be maintaining my activity and physical workouts? How am I eating well? Um, what am I doing to make sure that I'm healthy and happy? Uh, looking into being more scientific about that approach as well and thinking about my long-term future and thinking, okay, if I learn more about biology, if I learn more about medicine, I'll be able to take care of myself much better in the future instead of having to rely on other people to be my authority for my own health, which is, you know, again, very core to my identity and what's important to me. Yeah. So I want to I want to have that knowledge. I want to have that control. I want to contribute to that, both for my own benefit, for the pure knowledge and like philosophical pursuit, and then also as an entrepreneur and as like a humanitarian in a sense, it's also an extremely important field to be able to contribute to if you can help push the science further or if you can bring anything to the market that's going to have people um, you know uh, have better outcomes with their with their conditions or prevent any sort of uh, detrimental health conditions that's obviously like a super important thing in people's life so it felt like something meaningful that okay if i can learn enough if i can be ambitious and really push through and hard working then uh, you know that would be a rewarding career and it's something that there's so there's so much depth to the field of biology that I couldn't find in other things that I was interested in. So like as an entrepreneur, I was interested in software at the time um, when I was younger and like hardware, and you know just other fields of how can you make money in finance in real estate. And to some extent, I couldn't find the same depth that I felt like I could find in biology. So I knew that it was something that could provide a long-term career for me. Yeah, I mean biology is always going to be a growing field. And I think that it's a good one to get into, especially as an entrepreneur, because there are so many opportunities that you can kind of, you know, take by the scruff of the neck and go forward with. Um, and a lot of people are really interested in, you know, those big ideas of, you know, what's the next treatment or even maybe cure for a cancer or something. And, you know, so many people are focused on that. But 
you know, I like what you, I like your kind of thought process on it, how you kind of took a step back, you looked at the, you know, as a philosopher, you looked at the whole mm -hmm. big picture, um, and that kind of, you know, formulated you, and, you know, that's, that's why you're here, and I think that's yeah. really cool and unique, because I feel like a lot of people at Case were like, you know, maybe, you know, straight bio, biochemistry, or chemistry, you know, they found a, a niche in, you know, the human biology or, or something, or, or they found a medication that they really felt like could, you know, impact people's lives. But, like, it's just been, like, chemistry, these molecules, or biology, these cells. Um, but I think, I think your perspective and the way that you look at it is really unique, and I, I appreciate that. I really do. Definitely. Thanks. Um, I met Brandon in the spring of this year. Because uh, we're all part of the same program. I'm a second year at these two, our first year, and Brandon was a prospective student. And um, I showed Brandon around campus, and just getting to know his entire background and everything he's into, I was really inspired myself because the stuff we're learning is a little difficult because it's not like what you'd learn in schools. And it's a different approach to things. And Brandon, not coming from a science background, a philosophy background, I thought that it's really difficult. And... Um, to do what he's doing and especially because he mentioned that you read over 3,000 articles before coming into RGME so how was that entire process like how did you even start reading your first 10 and then know that you wanted to keep going yeah so um, the, I started off reading articles just like any normal person in the world would you know maybe you find something on like Healthline or WebMD like an article about a certain vitamin or nutrition and then I hadn't really known anything about academic journals and that sort of publication, but I started to notice that certain claims were being referenced, and I really wanted to like dive more into the actual understanding of things instead of just repeating what I read on a blog. And I thought, okay, this is really cool. People are actually citing um, where their information is from. And that was actually pretty unique to the field of health and biology, where with any other field, like people are just saying whatever they want to say, and you don't necessarily know it's what's true. their source yeah. and is this true. So I thought, okay, this is awesome. I could learn in this field on the, on the, on the internet for free, and everybody's going to tell me where they found out their information from. So I would start to open up these um, referenced articles, and I saw like the quality and the level of intellect that was going into producing these articles that I was just able to find online and read for free. And so I thought, okay, this is like a cool new hobby for me to learn. Um, I didn't feel like I was done learning, you know, even though I had already graduated undergrad, like I just felt like somebody who needed to continue to learn. And okay, this is this great source of primary scientific knowledge that I have access to. And the best scientists from around the world are putting in a year's worth of time and really formulating a, a well thought out and well studied uh, paper that I can learn from in 10 minutes. Yeah. And so I just started just grinding, just it, grinding out. it out and just reading as many as I could. And kind of, uh, I'm a person that gets like very much into rabbit holes. <laughs> so it became like addicting in a sense. And I was like, okay, let me, I just read about this thing in this paper. Let me read about this thing in that paper. And that's the thing about science and biology. Everything's connected. So you always get new ideas. And so every paper I read, I would start thinking more about how everything is connected and about what other questions do I have in this field? How can I learn more about this molecule's effect on the body in another instance or in this combination? I see. Uh, so really that just kept snowballing. And did you take notes on the side? Yeah, while so I set, up, I set up a, a database. So all I would reference, every time I found a good paper, I would take the DOI link, reference it, take any snippets, uh, as well, like what the most important takeaways were of that paper, mm -hmm. copy it out, paste it um, in like a subtext within, nested within the link that I found and like the title. Oh, wow. And then try to organize it based on either like a class of molecule or the disease that's being studied. So I was starting to also try to build up this idea of, um, you know, database organization and research organization because I thought, okay, this is going to be important to be able to convince people in the future. Uh, but for like marketing, but then I really started to learn like, no, this is going to be important for my own mental organization yeah. Yeah, to yeah. be able to actually learn the breadth of information that's out there. If I don't have a good way to organize my information, uh, it's it's going to become too much. It's going to become too messy. So for sure. I noticed that yeah. for sure I need to be documenting everything and organizing it so that my mind stays clear and and can compartmentalize and build upon subtopics into larger topics. Yeah, one of the things that 
I've talking to you about this in the past and hearing this is like I've read a ton of papers, right? But like it's almost coming from, you know, the classic biology background, you know, you you have classes where you learn how to read papers and sift through the information and write papers and all this kind of stuff. And looking at it from like my point of view, especially in undergrad, sometimes I'd be like, man, I don't want to read another paper. Like I have been going through this database. I've been looking for all these keywords, all this kind of stuff. I'm like, this is just, my eyes hurt. My mm-hmm. eyes and my head hurt. Yeah. And you come at it with a totally <laughs> new, fresh outlook where I could see if you had unlimited money, you you would subscribe to every journal out there and get every hard copy and mm-hmm. also get all the online mm-hmm. ones. And I think that's so commendable. And I like I like reading scientific papers. I think that they're very informative. I think they're super interesting. But I don't know if I could ever read three thousand of I don't know if I could read three thousand of anything just because I I know I wanted to. I know. Right? Like you you read papers <laughs> like I play PlayStation. Right. Like I yeah, just wake up and I just want right. to play PlayStation. You wake no, up and have you want like, to read papers. I would have like a hypothesis in my head and that's, <laughs> on my phone. I had like that's five hundred tabs open at once and then on my computer <laughs> like another five hundred tabs open. And yeah, it was just I mean, like I'd, I'd go to sleep and I'd still be I'd still be looking at stuff like during COVID that was really like um, it was a big time for me to like just uh, I was home with yeah. my family and like there wasn't much going on so uh, you know I set up a big monitor and I would just like stay in my room there you go <laughs> and just just keep reading till till yeah. my eyes hurt and like yeah at first it was at first it was like a lot of gibberish and like my head really did hurt and I couldn't tell like what was important mm-hmm. and when I was getting too far down a rabbit hole on like one pathway. Right. And it, how does this translate to anything important? So, so yeah, I guess I have a question for you. So while you were doing all that, what was your goal of like reading all those articles during yeah. COVID? Because like I took my MCAT. Yeah. I found this program because I was right. literally not trying to go to med school. <laughs> and like I was like, okay, I want to learn about the future of science because I thought like I heard about this thing called the Great Reset during COVID. I didn't know what industry that was really going to happen in because I even thought big things were happening in medicine. So for me, regenerative medicine was like, okay, this is the next frontier of science. But for you, what did you, what did you, what did you even, what was your end goal reading all these papers? Like, did you have, were you just going to start something? It was, uh, it goes back to being uh, a combination of just intellectual curiosity uh, and entrepreneurial drive in thinking like there's so much out there in the research that hasn't been translated yet into uh, therapies for people. So at first I thought, okay, I can make like some supplements. That's something that, uh, you know, anybody could do. You don't have to be a doctor. You don't have to have a PhD. Uh, You know, I could set up my own um, supplement processing lab and and create a supplement or different supplements to help people with their own conditions. So I was definitely reading stuff with the lens of like an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur's mindset of, okay, how do I find something valuable that's not yet commercialized and commercialize it? That was definitely driving me in terms of like, how do I make this practical? Um, But there was an underlying just intellectual curiosity about learning more about, you know, what drives the cells that, 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 you know, make up my body and make me who I am. Um, Yeah, I think um, one point that I wanted to say, just listening to that last part was, Again, I'm going to compare this to the classic biology background of um, I've, one thing that I've really learned here at Case and I've really changed my thinking is, you know, Case Western Reserve has a lot of spinoffs from the labs that are here. They have amazing labs and they create amazing companies that usually get bought out by Big Pharma. And it's, it's a very, very nice payday for those involved and the university, which is incredible. One of the things that I have seen a shift in, in the way that I think, in the way that I view science is um, academia science, you know, at your small labs, like your local labs, you know, they do great work and they have, you know, they publish papers and they inform the public about the new science and everything. Um, But changing that mindset to look at the commercialization of your science and the 10 extra things that you have to do besides science is so interesting to me now. And, you know, as you're talking about waking up and being obsessed and wanting to read papers and read papers and read papers, I'm now finding myself like, I have this 
incredible idea. If it, if it were to work in the lab, how, how would I get into the market? How can I get my foot into the door? You know, where is my um, intellectual property coming from? How am, I, how am I going to protect myself? Where is the money coming from? How am I going to make a lab? How am I going to scale this, this medicine or this idea up? Who's my market? Who's my, who's my target audience? And is that market big enough for me to put in, you know, $500 million into a drug and make it back in a good amount of time at a decent enough price? Because a lot of the new drugs that are being put on the market, Big Pharma is throwing in billions of dollars. And we talked about, I think in the first week, we were talking about, um, in the first week of class, we were talking about beta thalazima in that condition. And, you know, a company put in a billion dollars for this. They were selling that drug at a million dollars a dose. Yeah. That is crazy to me. And, like, I understand. And, you know, when you're like, oh, like, we need affordable medicine and all this stuff, looking at the background of it and how that drug was brought on the market after you know, needless to say, a 10 to 12 year process from drug discovery to, you know, the first injection after FDA approval. That's something I feel like is kind of, you know, looked past, yeah, right? It's a, it's a monumental undertaking and risk mm-hmm. to try to develop any drug. Your uh, rate of failure is so high. There are so many talented and smart people that are working on these companies and a lot of them without without applause or or any success at the end of it and so risk has to be rewarded and you know this is potentially depending on what you're working on it could be the most important thing in somebody's life mm-hmm. and how do you really um, how do you value that in a way that accounts for the benefit to the patient as well as the risk and the ability for uh, the entrepreneur or the corporation to make back their investment. I mean, like as an undergrad, like I was always talking to my mom. I was like, you know, I think if I don't, you know, become a doctor, I want to try to go into pharmaceuticals and make medicine. But my goal would be to make medicine affordable. Mm -hmm. Looking at how medicines are made now and learning more of that process, it's getting harder and harder to make affordable drugs, especially when they're patented. Um, And when you can put any, any price you want on it, when it's FDA approved and it's your drug, you know, until the 17, 18, 20 years when someone can make a generic of it. And I think that that's, you know, kind of like a sad reality of, of medicine now, but also from a, you know, commercialization entrepreneur part, like entrepreneurship part, like, you know, it's a very, very nice market to get into if you can't be successful. Uh, when we look at the whole research industry, I can I usually think of two things. Some people will do research in finding this specific pathway of a caterpillar that was it's a new discovery for humanity, you know, you find out things. Whereas the research that I feel like we're involved in in this industry, it's highly specific to humans and solving diseases for us that's translatable and also usable. So I think there's like this um, opportunity cost of like doing research for 10, 20 years, but at least it's going in a direction. Like somebody can take your research and even if it, like you said, doesn't have something at the end, Somebody can use your method, use your reasoning, and try and do something else, which actually might translate into something good for humans. And yeah. um, I guess we can transition into, like, so after reading all those pa- papers and now yeah. being part of this program yeah. and having professors come and talk to us about real-life application of that, what have you noticed between you having that theoretical mm-hmm. or that paper knowledge versus you seeing it in person? So what is the difference, do you feel yeah. like? Well, definitely I've come here to get a more realistic viewpoint uh, on how this ther- on how these regenerative medicines and stem cell therapies could be used in actual patients. Mm-hmm. And so understanding more about what the challenges and the problems are have been my primary focus because I'm, as an entrepreneur, as an optimist, I'm <laughs> going to be thinking about how there's a solution here and there's a solution there and this thing is so powerful and potent mm-hmm. and it could solve all these problems and I know that at the same time there's so many challenges to this field and I and I and I want to be taught what those challenges are what are people's real life experiences uh, that have made them fail or have made it very difficult and time-consuming or expensive to get their therapy to the next stage and so the more that I can map out all the challenges that other people have come across that in its own way is knowledge as well as things that haven't worked or things that have 
made things more difficult because then I could put it on my on my roadmap, on my vision, as the things that I need to solve instead of just saying, I need to find a way to sell this thing. I need to find a way to get this approved. Uh, I need to raise money. Mm-hmm. It changes the whole dynamic into these are the problems that exist every step of the way. That's my roadmap. I just have to focus on solving that problem, solving that problem, solving that problem. Eventually, if I do all that, there will be an end, a better end product. And I think the most important thing is to really care about the quality of the product that you're creating. It's not just to take something that you found and rebrand it and figure out a use for it and, and, and run to the market. Because what are you running towards is a 12 year uh, a 12 year battle anyway. And if you mm-hmm. haven't if you haven't done the groundwork to make your product as best as it can before you do that 12 year investment, it's it's not fair to the people on your team and the investors and the patients that if you had waited another five years and really developed your product, that then everybody is going to benefit. You have a higher chance of success. You have better patient outcomes. You have uh, you know more rewarding endeavor. And when you're really thinking about things on like a 12-year time scale, I think you've got to do the, the upfront legwork. It's going to make everything more valuable, even if it makes it a 17-year journey to get the, to get the approval. Uh, you have to increase your chances of success, of success and you have to make a better, you have to be interested in really making a better product and solving not just like one problem, but like solving multiple problems before trying to see if that now is the thing that's going to work because there's been so many failures by so many smart people, so many amazing teams. So the, the best way to get an advantage is to really do the groundwork on creating a better product, understanding what all the challenges were, and have you actually solved a couple problems at least with your product before going to the market um, or trying so to get something improved. An example I think of when, when you mentioned this is Athesis. So when they developed this multi-stem um, platform, which was solving a few diseases uh, with mesenchymal stem cells, and when COVID came around, they thought they would just That's try COVID. it out, yeah. try it out with COVID. And how many people are doing COVID? A hundred, you know, a hundred or a thousand. Like, what are you adding? What are you adding even to the scientific community by just yeah. rushing to get your product to the same indication that a, a bunch of other people are they doing? Wasted a lot of money. And what happened yeah. to Atherosis, Nick? What happened to the multi stem? <laughs> like, yeah, they just uh, they just recently. I just actually did a presentation on them. They just recently. Um, fail. They missed their endpoint in Japan for their latest stroke phase three trial, and uh, it's it's not looking good. They just cut, I believe, seventy percent of all employees. They are they are changing that the whole company from top to bottom. the The two co founders in the last two years have left. They have hired a new CEO. They have a new board. Um, and it's sad because there was so much they're losing, potential. Well, right, and they're they're losing investors. You know, they're losing on their evaluations. But you know, one thing that when I was doing that and looking at kind of you know, looking more business side of of these great companies is, um, you know, it maybe sometimes things need to change, um, and this whole change from from employees top to bottom whoever's running it, um, maybe this is what they need to to really get into the science, lay down, you know, rework some of that groundwork that they were doing. Yeah. Um, so the idea was there, but, you know, maybe they're applying it to too many things or maybe they're missing something. Um, I think talking to somebody who knows about atherosis, I, I, I want to say that, like, the way that they did, like, their, their initial testing to, like, prove to themselves that it worked um, was on, like, a different like demographic than like you know a very a very small demographic mm-hmm. versus what they were doing in Japan and kind of their other phase three trials and I think that might be why it kind of went under a little bit um, but you know it, from top to bottom maybe the changes will make the science better and get them on the market um, but yeah Athos is a great example of that mm-hmm. um, you know they the idea was great to two guys from Stanford medical school have found this unbelievable um, science and you know sometimes sometimes it just doesn't work out too you know it's it's crazy to think about looking under a microscope and seeing how all these cells work and then as soon as you put them in just like this the tiny like 
smallest different environment, how they can just change, like, so yeah. drastically. Um, I think so. their mistake, though, was chasing the money. And oh, fix me if I'm well, wrong, but, like, COVID brought a lot of funding to a ton of companies, especially in the medical industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just trying to get that funding, I feel like they made that vital error because it, when you when you prove your science doesn't work for something, the investors who don't know the science, they're just out. Yeah. Because they're like, what do you mean? Well, they, you had, know? they had two of their top investors pull out after Japan, after the yeah. Japan fiasco. They just got, very recently, they just um, received, I think, around $13 million. But $13 million is a, is a, drop, in, is a drop in the ocean for them. I mean, yeah. they were... They were getting they were getting money pumped into them for years yeah. for this. And if you think about it, they're trying to they were trying to use one product more or less to treat a bunch ten of different indications. Each one of those could cost a billion dollars. Mm-hmm. And so think of all the money that you're spending just to try something out on a population. If that money had gone towards better product development mm-hmm. first, and if you have more success in one thing first, yeah. then you can start expanding. I so, think. I think. So I, I do. I do points. think people think that success is, in a way, correlated to like money. how many indications are you going yeah. after, how much money have you raised, how far are you in your uh, yeah. in your clinical trials. But like, if you don't get approved, like all that was a big smoke show. I think one of the biggest things too is like where they were doing their clinical trials trials because in Japan I believe as soon as you hit phase like once you pass phase one safety and you hit phase two you can start charging. Oh really? You can start charging for in the Japan? drug. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. no way. Yeah. So they had some they had a, a little bit of a avenue of revenue from Got there. It. But huh. but, you know, I, and it goes back to the market of, mm-hmm. you know, I think what they were trying to do and why they were trying to go, you know, expand that multi-stem mm-hmm. so, so much was because of how many markets they could hit and how much money they could bring back into yeah. the company, which I think is, you know, in one in one light, it's great. You're helping a ton of people. You're trying to help a ton of diseases all around the world. But at the same time, like, it... You seem a you little money hungry. You gotta, you gotta it. prove it. You At gotta prove it before you can be money hungry. Before you can start yeah. charging out the wazoo for all these drugs, yeah. you know, and and have all these claims. So um, interesting that you bring up um, Japan actually, because one of the things that got me in specifically into the field of stem cell research was this one group that was working on a type of cell called a muse cell. And it's actually not really spoken about for some reason that much in America. In There aren't really clinical trials um, being developed around this type of cell. And in academia, they don't talk about it. But it's actually a type of mesenchymal stem cell that has uh, embryonic surface markers and does in vivo um, spontaneously differentiate into functionalized tissue. So this is like an embryonic and these aren't style. IPSCs? No, these they're are not, not they're, IPSCs. No, they're naturally <laughs> and they're called potent. they're called what? Muse. M U S E. Wow. Yeah, multi. This is paper now. Multi okay. stress enduring uh, stem cells, and so what? these have pluripotent stem cell markers, and inherently have the capacity to uh, create functional tissue in the brain, in the heart, anywhere really in your entire body, and they're already circulating within your body. So hmm. I also think that. Like we kind of jumped from embryonic stem cells to pluripotent stem cells, and then we thought, okay, these are all cancerous, so now let's go to adult stem cells, and then people start finding, you know, one one you know a type of stem cell within the body and a type of indication that they want to connect it to, and it's really most important why I love doing like that depth of research is to really first see like what. You know, as a philosopher, I'm like, what is the most potent starting point? And yeah. I, until I read everything and felt confident that I found what the most potent starting point was and, like, knew that there's something that, which logically makes sense, something that your body's already naturally doing and using to try yeah. to to try to repair and regenerate um, that we can then build off of, I wasn't satisfied in thinking, okay, now I have a path, like, of, of how this all can translate because yeah. now I know that we can try to mimic that pathway using these these cells, which are very, they're, they're extremely successful right now and they're like phase one and phase two trials. They're trying to repair all these different neurodegenerative conditions wow. like ALS. Um, and Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi Ken awesome. has picked up the, um, the, the rights to this 
to this scientific group and this project and they're doing the that's huge that's awesome. that's yeah they're, they're that's like incredible. you know a massive multi-billion dollar company so they're not investing in nothing and i feel like a lot of times people here in america are not paying enough attention to science in, in some other countries especially probably in china and japan and yep. they are extremely advanced and people here because they're the top in their field in their university even that's like such a big deal but in the end of the day this is one global field you know we're all working with the same body mm -hmm. the same mechanism of stem cells that we have available to source and program and you really need to first look at what's everything that's been found first don't think like in my lab i'm going to find something new most likely somebody in the world has found something better that you can build off of. And mm -hmm. that's the idea that I really want to work with in the stem cell field is awesome. the idea of stem cells as a platform. Yeah. Think of like drugs and drug design. That's an entire platform that's taken hundreds of years probably to advance to where it is today, where you're not just saying, I'm going to take that extract from this, uh, this tree bark and I'm going to cure cancer with it. Yeah. If you really want to do something amazing, that's better than what the natural world has already provided us, whatever our bodies are already capable of, you're going to say this chemical structure is a backbone, it's a platform that we can now engineer. And I think, and it's the best, I'm going to look for, for among all the molecules that are related to this that already exist, I'm going to pick the best starting point, and then I'm going to modify it and test it to see what has the best results. I'm going to engineer it, I'm going to evolve it. And I think that with stem cells, it's not as it exists within our body, as it exists in the, in, in the dish, in the, in the lab, it isn't a panacea. It is not a cure yet. It's a platform. And we have to think of it like that and think of it in terms of how are we going to evolve these stem cells so that they have the capacity to do this regeneration and repair that they can't normally do. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, what are you really doing to step outside the bounds of what our bodies are already trying so hard to do in terms of maintaining homeostasis? Yeah. And, and so I think that finding out about these uh, mu cells that they were studying in Japan and also another similar type of, of cell called a V cell, which some um, labs here at Louisville, uh, at University of Louisville are also studying here, uh, have these embryonic surface markers and are naturally pluripotent and have the ability to regenerate all different types of tissue in the body without being cancerous, wow. those give us, I think, a Are these midpoint. endogenous? Like, these are they, endogenous. They yeah, like let's say, you, let's say somebody has a stroke or a heart attack. These cells are being mobilized from the bone marrow and uh, homing into the site of inflammation and cell death. They're picking up local cues from the environment and they're able to wow, integrate really and create. Wow, really mesenchymal. Huh? Yeah, it's, 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 really it's, it's what people thought mesenchymal stem cells were at first, but, but it's a subtype that has embryonic that has these dormant embryonic properties. They're they're Even more they're more native. Yeah, That's they really remain dormant. Cool. They remain dormant in your body. They haven't become fully mature yet, Jeez. and they're still maintaining a high residency both within the bone marrow and a little bit is always just circulating and is increased in circulation during stress conditions. And so I think that what we can do is take, I, you can really take any cell from, from, from the body now that we know how to reprogram things. And then once you IPS, you use the, the, the IPSC technology, okay. that was the Nobel Prize. 2012. Um, yeah, yeah two, 2012 Japan. Nobel Prize uh, discovery. So yeah. we can take any of your cells even one thing that I'm researching right now is urinary stem cells. Yep. So thinking of it again from like the perspective like of an entrepreneur and not just like a scientist is how do you like think about like the consumer, like a normal person, how do they want to interact right. with medicine? You know, how do you make it more convenient for them so that you can bring more people into the conversation and get involved in this new platform? Yeah. So I think the idea of sourcing, okay, we need like a stem cell like and that, that could be easily reprogrammed into an IPSC, okay? So I've been researching these urinary stem cells as a cheap, simple, and effective way to get stem cells from everybody in the world that are their own line. Because mm -hmm. the other thing is most corporations right now are thinking about using a donor stem cell line, yep. and they're gonna give you one injection for it, and hopefully that's gonna cure your disease, and hopefully you're not gonna have a bad immune rejection for it, yeah. or they're gonna put you on a bunch of other drugs. But it's not a sustainable way about thinking about the platform of this industry, I think. Exactly. It could have specific use cases, but ideally, people should have their own stem cells that are available to them, mm -hmm. and there's no reason yeah. why that's not, we have all the technology to be able to do that, 
And so I think that we really need to move towards giving people that knowledge, giving people that access to start to create their own medical stem cell yeah. line, and then working on that platform about how do we repair your stem cells. So once, once and among the same process of doing this induced pluripotent uh, reprogramming to mm -hmm. get it back to this state where it has uh, you know, more stem-like properties so it can become any type of cell, then what else can we do? Why are we only thinking about this IPSC as a solution? Again, this idea of reprogramming could have a lot more, um, could have a lot more to it than meets the eye. We can also go in and repair the mitochondria, reprogram the mitochondria. We can induce uh, autophagy and try to recycle mm -hmm. old proteins and, and build new lysosomes, like induce lysosome, uh, lysosomal biogenesis. Mm -hmm. So we can go in and do all these things to the cell that are very basic about cell biology. It's like, what is a cell made of? Again, like, what are we made of? What is a cell made of? How do you just restore that cell to a healthy state first and then go on and manufacture it? So w like once you have a single cell, you can do anything. Like all, like all our cells are in a way immortal. They've come from a single lineage in a sense, right? Like you get, your entire body was created from an embryo. You have a germ cell line, that a, a, a germ cell line of, mm -hmm. of cells. Those germ cells then go on to continue to, to live and propagate in a future offspring. So in a way, there is no limit to the mortality of cells. They can, in, in theory, be continuously reprogrammed and maintained in a state of stem-like regeneration yeah. and proliferation. So how do we mimic that process of, uh, of germline propagation and reprogramming within our own bodies so that we can uh, basically allow our stem cells to maintain uh, immortal proliferative capacity and understanding the challenges of why our bodies don't do that normally. The main challenge is that these cells are extremely potent and proliferative and can become cancerous. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that in the body they're undergoing all this type of different stress and damage so the body's going to limit its proliferative capacity because it doesn't want damaged cells to be proliferated yeah but what we can do is we can take your cell out we can reprogram it we can give it infinite proliferative capacity again we can repair its dna we can repair the mitochondria we can repair the uh pro the proteome like recycle out the pro the proteins uh reinvigorate the lysosomes and then now you have even if it's a single cell, you can start with a single cell. As long as you've really worked to reprogram that and bring that cell back to health, now you can then go on to create an infinite number of pluripotent stem cells, similar to these muse cells yeah. that can then be delivered slowly, perhaps. You know, maybe <clears throat> the process of regeneration should mimic the process of generation. When you're a baby, you don't just boom, become an adult yeah. like that. You have to have a very controlled growth. And every single day, your cells are dividing in a very controlled manner. And there's not enough discussion about dosing in terms of stem cells as well. It needs to be something for the maximum result. It has to be something that mimics that process where it's extremely controlled and it's happening on a regular and consistent basis. Yeah. But that doesn't fit into the biopharmaceutical model of you coming in and you getting an injection, right? Yeah, so. Great. So I, I think that I think that we have to figure out a way to to maintain the potency of these pluripotent stem cells because they're they're so powerful. But we have to find a way to make them non non cancerous, yeah. which our body has figured out a way to do. And there are papers studying these endogenous pluripotent stem cells and what pathways and mechanisms they have that limit their cancerous capacity because they do also those are the same stem cells that are also most linked to tumor formation. The, these endogenous pluripotent stem cells are also now give us a platform to study the the, the causes of cancer. Yeah. Because if you look into any cancer, you'll see these embryonic surface markers, uh, SSEA3, SSEA4, are the most highly expressed and the most uh, the most stem-like, the most initiating and, and 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 proliferative and the most resistant to damage because they have this they have this embryonic-like potency and resiliency. And they, if you just look at a tumor in and of itself, it's kind of like an organoid is, is, is growing within your body and yeah. it's, it's demanding all the, uh, all the nutrients that it can and it's protecting itself in every way that it can as if it's its own yeah. life and it doesn't really care about the outside. So we have to understand also the 
embryonic and pluripotent nature of cancer, and that's why you see when you inject induced pluripotent stem cells, you have cancer arising. And yeah. then people ran away from it. They're like, oh, we can't do induced pluripotent stem right. cells directly because it's cancerous. And really what we should have noticed is that one, okay, natural endogenous cancer is also arising from endogenous pluripotent stem cells or reprogramming yeah. into pluripotent cells. So let's look more into that. That's gonna be a great cue as to how we can control or target cancer. And the other thing that we should be noticing is Okay, we also have endogenous pluripotent stem cells that aren't always causing cancer. How do we mimic those pathways to create a, a, a therapy that's not Yeah, cancerous? I think that's great. And I think, you know, we're, we'd love to go in. Yeah, this I was going to say, we're over time. <laughs> this, this, I mean, this that was, was awesome. awesome. This is yeah. great. I mean, great content for, you know, the people listening. It was We'll break down everything you just said oh, in yeah. another episode if, yeah. if you're willing to come back. Of course. And, yeah. then, and then, you know, there's definitely like a whole vision to this that starts, yes, with the sourcing mm-hmm. and the reprogramming. But then the, uh, the cryo-freezing, the engineering, the manufacturing, the quality controls, all these things that you were discussing about mm-hmm. how hard it's going to be to translate have to become a roadmap in the same way. And definitely, so I'm happy yeah. to go over maybe not in such detail because it's a lot but I'm happy to go over the future as well of the vision and the challenges that are needed to engineer this platform into something that's viable Mm -hmm. and and what those challenges are and what those solutions that different researchers have found along the way that I'm trying to connect into one vision yeah I mean it's incredible so as much as I don't want to end this I'm gonna ask you, Heem, do you have anything else before we do? No, no, not not not, 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 not in this one, right? <laughs> but I'm gonna say, Brian, oh, thank- we went 41 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's okay. It's to be 20. It's right. okay. Yeah, it's all right. It's okay. No, thank you for coming yeah, on. Of course, thank you I'm for sure having that, me. I'm sure that the people on this channel will be seeing you a lot from okay, now cool. on. I'm sure that they will. The stuff that you were bringing to the table, you were making me think really hard. <laughs> I'm sure you're making Heem think really hard. And I think that it's great that you know Heem and I coming from those. You know the biology backgrounds. You yeah. coming from that? You know, yeah. coming from kind of left field. I do, not, I do yeah. not even know how to handle a cell. I just, <laughs> I just know what. And I've, tri- I've just tried to learn what the best great. people are doing and what the what the most um, fundamental research is out there by reading. And I think that I think that people really have to value reading in this field yeah. a lot. Well, I think because you have you have to find the, and and work upon the best of what's already out there. Yeah, I think and I think that that you know coming from a background where you've never handled, you know, a cell culture in your life, it it's, does not mean that you can never be successful in the field of biology. So, never. you know, I just want to say, I, once again, thank you for coming yeah, on. You. This will not be the last time you're on. Thank you. Guys. Um, I want to say to everybody watching um, that this has been Cells to Cell. I'm Nick Petrozzi. That's Brandon. Heem. That's Brandon. And uh, we appreciate you guys watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you. See you guys. See you.